Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Micah Zenko, who is a fellow at the Center for Preventive Action at the Council on Foreign Relations. He is the author of a new book, Between Threats and Wars, U.S. Discrete Military Operations in the Post-Cold War World. Micah, welcome to Berkeley. Great. Thank you. Happy to be here. Where were you born and raised? <clears throat> I was born uh, in Green Bay, Wisconsin, raised there uh, pretty much my whole life. <laughs> and looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Um, well, it was quite interesting. My two grandfathers served in the Navy uh, in World War II. My father served as an Air Force uh, sergeant in Vietnam. But then I was also connected to many of people I grew around, I grew up around with were uh, refugees from the wars of Southeast Asia. So Hmong, Khmer, Laotian uh, populations are heavily resettled in Wisconsin and St. Paul, Minneapolis era area. So it was interesting to see my father, who had been a Air Force uh, staff sergeant in Vietnam, and people who were the refugees, who were the victims of those conflicts, who came back to the United States to live in a sort of more open society. So it was both my grandparents, you know, the stories of them and my father, and then friends uh, and associates who I grew up with who came from Southeast Asia. And, and these stories of people who were the, the victims of bombing, I mean, how uh, uh, how, how did that affect you? I mean... Well, it, it, it has to do with, in particular, the Hmong people who, were, uh, who worked first on behalf of the French uh, in opposition to the Japanese and on behalf... Well, they first they fought the Japanese, they fought the French, and they fought on behalf of the United States against the, uh, the Patet Lao, which were a, co a communist uh, group who were in control in Vientiane and Laos. And after the United States CIA presence started leaving, very late in the game, uh, they have to leave in very large numbers because they're, mm. you know, marked for death, and they come in very in very big numbers to Southern California, to the Long Beach area, to Minneapolis, to Montana, and to uh, Northern Wisconsin, and so it's just these people who had a direct impact of both the U.S. and Soviet influences in Southeast Asia who came to the United States when given the opportunity to live, and very difficult adjustments for them to do so as well. And, and what, so, so in, in this context, where do you really get in school the international relations, uh, politics, defense policy bug? Um, University of Wisconsin-Madison, where I went as an undergrad, has a huge, uh, long-standing, great political science department, good East Asia studies department, and also, again, the, the wars of Vietnam sort of imprint on the consciousness of the campus. I mean, the largest opposition to uh, U.S. presence in Vietnam was consistently out of University of Wisconsin-Madison, very uh, violent street protests against the, uh, the campus and its support for military, um, uh, military research and development there. And so you still see it. I mean, you still feel it when you walk around the campus. So that both imprints on my sort of interests but then once you get interested, you just want to study and dig down further and further and further. And uh, had was able to work with some great professors there. And it really cemented, in my mind, a great interest in US behavior, US foreign policy in the world. Mm -hmm. And then your graduate work. I uh, went to George Washington University, which is very much a public policy school where you work during the day and you go to school at night. So you know, I worked at the Congressional Research Service, the Brookings Institution, the State Department, and a couple of other small places where I was able to do, f at a very research assistant level, uh, digging into these issues day to day, uh, how to do research, how to do budgets, how to understand US foreign policy process, how to understand who's who, and then at night take the courses that serve as the sort of theoretical foundation for that, as well as some more practical training into how I go about the presence. I went from there to Brandeis University, where I uh, worked for a PhD in political science in the Department of Politics. I was there for two years, did my coursework, spent five years at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, which is, again, where one of these public policy schools where everybody just sh shows up to give talks and you get to learn and rub elbows with other people who are Curious about the uh, curious about the world, uh, and and w w give us the years here. So you are working on your uh, dissertation uh, when and in, in relation to the end of the Cold War. Uh, my uh, first course was basically September was around September 11, 2001, for my PhD, mm -hmm. and so uh, you know it's, it's quite interesting because I 
at George Washington, our sort of master's project, group project, was looking at counter homeland security and counterterrorism. And that was a time when the United States was spending some six to eight billion dollars in defending the United States. Today we spend about 55 billion dollars. And then September 11 hit, and it really changed the way a lot of people were looking at the world. In particular, the sort of neorealist uh, state as the actor for how to study the world. And then people realize, well, state actors might not be the, the end all be all for what the United States wants to do in the world and for its impact on sort of international, international history. So it was right at that time that I got, that I got uh, started on my, uh, on my coursework. So before we talk about the, 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 your conclusion in your book, which is quite interesting and very relevant for what's going on today and how we're pursuing wars, uh, uh, especially in the Middle East uh, and in South Asia, uh, what, what is the nature of the international environment. We, the Cold War ends, then we get 9-11, and, and I think it's, it's critical to, to setting that context mm -hmm. in order to, to uh, understand uh, your insights. So, so talk a little about America's relative power, uh, the threats it faces uh, in, in this new world. Well, you know, in the 90s, late 90s, and even before 9-11, people used the terms like hegemony, primacy, unipolarity, um, the Soviet Union uh, going through, uh, former Soviet states going through massive uh, um, uh, birth rates declining, economic development dropping to nothing, just you know, things being sold off, massive corruption, very limited state uh, spending, uh, and in Russia in particular, really relying upon its nuclear, nuclear weapons force as the, sort of last, uh, as the last sense of it being a superpower. And the United States was seen as this untouched unipolar actor, and this was felt also and reinforced by places like Kosovo and in Bosnia, where the European Union or European Security Defense Force couldn't on its own compel uh, Serbian aggression to stop and was not willing to check Slobodan Milosevic in 1999. And it's just this default position to the United States playing some role with its NATO allies and also strengthening alliances in East Asia against China, which at the time was still seen as quite decades away in the distance of, of matching U.S. Uh, GDP or matching U.S. sort of conventional power projection capabilities. On the back end of this is the sort of threats of ballistic missiles. If you remember the 1998 Rumsfeld Commission on Ballistic Missile Threats as being a primary way that state sponsors like Iran and North Korea could threaten the United States homeland with a ballistic missile. But the threat of uh, insecure fissile material, of nuclear terrorism, of non-state actors, of uh, even Al Qaeda after 1996 when it declares war, and the, U and the East Asian Embassy bombings of 98, they're just not that much of a focus. And I and I recommend to your viewers there's a, an important book in 2000, edited by William Crystal called Present Dangers, and it's the sort of neoconservative uh, sweep of the world. And they have uh, chapters on all the different threats to the United States, and it's North Korea, and it's Iran, and it's uh, uh, Russia, China. And nowhere in it did they mention Al Qaeda or Osama bin Laden. And this is a, just very shortly before 9/11, because even in the neoconservative world, non-state actors were not seen as uh, threats that could really do great damage to uh, the U.S. homeland. And so that's the world that you're sort of set upon. And 9/11 changes a great deal of that perspective. And and it, it's after 9/11 that that uh, we we there, there is this general consensus about the main threat is terrorism, non-state actors, states that are sponsors of terrorism, uh, and proliferation. Right. It's the, it's the threat of insecure fissile material landing in the hand of a non-state actor who can create an improvised nuclear device to test or use against the United States, its allies, or its deployed forces. That becomes the primary threat. And the response to that problem is not about overwhelming conventional military power. It's about securing fissile material where it lasts. It's about dealing with the rising threat of Al Qaeda, all of which are, you know, the term Kofi Annan always uses passports without, or problems without passports, which require broader international cooperation. You know, the United States cannot compel Pakistan or, or Russia to secure its uh, nuclear weapons or fissile material. They cannot compel France or Japan, which has tons of fissile material to do it. Uh, they also, but what they can do is invade Afghanistan and shut down a massive unchecked safe haven where Al Qaeda operate, but as you one would expect, they disperse to, you know, they have, they, they have a role in defending themselves and they disperse to other countries. And again and again, it just requires broader cooperation with other actors, which was not 
perceived as being necessary so much before 9-11. Uh, there, there's another story here that's implicit in, in your book, which is the evolution of technology uh, and America's history of turning to technology mm -hmm. for a fix as it confronts a, a geopolitical problem. Mm -hmm. So t tell us a little about uh, the, the development of these, these um, uh, unmanned aircraft mm -hmm. and how they come to fit into the picture. Well, drones for the use of surveillance exist in as, soon, er, as early as the Vietnam War, but they don't have much of a role in a practical manner in U.S. defense policy until the mid-1990s when the Predator drone, which can loiter for much longer, much higher altitudes, go much further distances, is a fairly good surveillance instrument. It's used first in the mid-90s to enforce the Dayton Peace Accords to see if Serbian forces have moved to where they say they're supposed to be and the Croats and the Muslims are where they're supposed to be. But the term people always use is it's like seeing the battlefield through a soda straw. You know, you can see something, but it's very, very limited. The, the aperture is not very wide. So you can watch a road, you can watch an encampment, uh, and you can sit over it for a very long time. You can loiter, but you can't see a wide, uh, wide thing. And you also just don't know who the people are on the ground, necessarily. They've gotten better and better with time. Um, if you read the 9-11 Commission, it has a very interesting account of when uh, Vice Admiral Scott Fry, who I interviewed for my book, who, when he was the, dep he was the Director of Operations of Joint Staff, starts to think about, we might need to think, uh, develop other ways to get after specifically bin Laden, Osama bin Laden, who by that time they believed they had the justification to kill and they had a memorandum of notification for President Clinton to do so. Scott Fry, Vice Admiral Scott Fry, turns to his, uh, one of his assistants, whose name is uh, Brigadier General Scott Gratian, who I also interviewed. Scott Gratian is now the Obama administration's lead person for the Comprehensive Peace Agreement in Sudan. Interestingly enough, though, he was an Air Force officer before then, and they look at how do you match what is a unmanned drone that is used primarily for surveillance to use have a strike mission, and they come up with uh, attaching a Hellfire missile, which is an anti-tank missile intended to stop the Soviet Red Army tank uh, tanks from coming across uh, Eastern Europe into West to defend NATO, and they figure out a way to mount what are anti-tank missiles essentially on top of the predator drones so that by roughly 1999-2000 they can use these to strike. But then there's a bigger issue which is not technology which is a fight between the Pentagon and the CIA about who's going to have control and who's going to fund these because at first neither one of them really wants to have this mission because it's not core to their identities but that's another story. So, so, and, and so how long does this creative idea, I guess you would call it creative, and its actual implementation, how, how, how many years is that? Uh, they start working on it in 98, 99. They're used after December 2001 when U.S. invades Afghanistan. There are something like 50 major strikes in Afghanistan uh, against suspected Taliban and Al-Qaeda officials. So it takes three to four years. But, that, but there's also issues of weather, of money, of authority, which ha all had to be settled within the White House and the CIA and the Pentagon. I see. And uh, uh, but and, and this theme about the 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 turf struggle, uh, in the end, uh, who wins that? The Pentagon. In the end, the well, now everyone flies drones and mm. everyone flies armed drones. But at the time, the CIA was given the authority to fly them, and so uh, the CIA took control of some, the Pentagon took control of others. So the ones that were flown over Afghanistan, which is declared war zone, are to this day run by DOD. The ones which are flown over Pakistan are run by the CIA. The ones that were flown over Yemen in 02 and reportedly uh, now in Yemen, uh, well, it depends where they fire or they don't. Um, so the one in 02 in Yemen, there was this famous drone strike, was controlled by the CIA. It just depends on where they are. If they're covert operations outside of sort of declared known war zones, they're CIA. If they're within uh, declared war zones like Afghanistan and Iraq, they're run by the Pentagon. Uh, now, an, a, a critical factor here is uh, once you go this route is who actually are we striking? Uh, because uh, because of many concerns that we'll talk about in a minute. So so what? Let's again place this historically. What is the story of American intelligence capacity, which is uh, will answer the question: Where do we go once we have this technology? Well, the in '98, 
uh, President Clinton signs a memoranda which goes after one person, which is Bin Laden, because he's the one who has declared war on the United States and they believe they have evidence to do so. After 9-11, there's a, uh, about a week later, there's a, President Bush signs a wider agreement which says you can go after uh, a, like a handful to a couple dozen people. And this is a prioritized list that is based upon sort of highest intelligence, people that have been involved in operational planning of uh, terrorist attacks and connect to Al Qaeda for years. And then uh, this list tends to change and emerge based upon detention and interrogation and building up a wider understanding of what Al Qaeda is. So really interesting that happens that in 2004, the United States which for a long time had this extraordinary rendition program where they captured people in Pakistan, in the Middle East, in Afghanistan, and then, and then held them in uh, undisclosed sites in Eastern Europe and in Thailand and Afghanistan for, to gather more intelligence. The U.S. basically stops doing this. And the reason is the uh, Congress and the White House can't decide what's the jurisdiction under which they'll be tried. Um, there's also allegations, which were later proven out, of torture and waterboarding and who really has the authority to do that and whether it meets with the Army Field Manual. So after 04, we stopped detaining people uh, for the most part. We still have detained. You mean as part of the rendition? Uh, yeah, yeah, as part of the rendition program that largely ends, although we still, there are still some people who enter it, but in very, very limited numbers. I mean, if you look at the, I believe it's the 2002 uh, State Department um, Human Rights Report on Pakistan, there were something like 500 people detained in Pakistan handed over to the United States. And my understanding is there hasn't been any since 04. 04, incidentally, is when the U.S. drone strikes start in Pakistan because we're not detaining them any longer because we can't agree with what to do to them, so we're going to do targeted killings. Um, so that list, that list of who's to be targeted sort of builds up as you get intelligence. In mid-2008, the threshold for who can be targeted, specifically in Pakistan, is lowered and lowered and lowered. It's anyone who is believed to provide operational support to people that are involved in trying to destroy the, the regime in Islamabad or trying to attack U.S. forces in Afghanistan. It's the, uh, David Sanger's book, he calls it, it's like the common man, pers the common man uh, signature, which is anyone who's providing, uh, or looks like they're providing operational support. So we used to know the names at one time of everyone that was targeted by the United States. That level of threshold is gone now. It's people who, through collecting intelligence and loitering, over their camps for a long time, you can determine our providing support, and they can be targeted. But but has has the the quality of our ground intelligence in this cycle that you're describing improved or not? Uh, it has significantly in Pakistan, largely because we go after some targets which the Pakistani government wants taken out. These well, these yeah. are threats to their own regime. They have their own reasons to have them killed. Uh, so y yes, we do have a much better understand on the ground in Pakistan who we go after. In Yemen, there have been five strikes from December 09 to April 2010, I'm sorry, May 2010, and there we didn't have much on the ground, and that's why quite a few of these were, uh, were errors, because we were trying to collect intelligence from, from the air. But in Pakistan, we have a very good idea who we're targeting. But, but, but uh, Pakistan's enemies may not necessarily be our enemies, mm -hmm. correct? So, so we're, we, we uh, th does the CIA, uh, and the mili U.S. military have assets on the ground, or do we rely on third parties? Yes, and yes. Okay, <laughs> okay. And but 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 so so we your your overall evaluation is that the quality of who we're going after, where they are, when we can get them, that that has improved. It has improved overall, but if you look at the number of strikes. Uh, even with the improvements, there inevitably are still mistakes made. Um, there, I mean, there were 40 strikes under President uh, Bush. There have been like 160 strikes in, just in Pakistan under President Obama. So there have been a total of 200 now. And you wouldn't do 200 of anything involving humans without errors. There's also this slight issue of Muslim custom where people are buried before sunset. So you often don't know. You can't get DNA samples necessarily of who was taken. Militants come in. They take the bodies away immediately and they're removed quite quickly. But uh, the, the people who are, go who are doing this targeting, who, uh, are, who have been involved in it, and it's been the same group of people largely for the last five or six years, over two administrations, they're much, much better at it. They're much more careful about civilian casualties and collateral damage than they were before. Now, the, we, we've, I'm walking you through the whole kind of geopolitical uh, situation, the use of technology, and I think it's important also to, to emphasize uh, an element of the domestic politics, not mm. yet 
about the conflict between military and civilians, but really the legacy of the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. which is not to have American soldier casualties mm -hmm. in, in our conflicts. Talk a little about that, because after 9-11, we're in a situation where the homeland has been hit. Mm -hmm. We've got to respond, but we really don't want to lose American lives uh, as we respond. Well, since the beginning of time, anybody who can replace uh, humans with technology, they've tried to do so in warfare, and the United States is no different. The difference is the United States is really at the cutting edge of technological innovation on how to do this, and the, what they call the sort of target acquisition, the ability to deliver missiles from a safe distance, um, the ability to do after-action reports and follow-up to determine what is your damage assessment. These, the, the, what they call the kill chain of how you go about this, they're really better and better and better and better. And absolutely, there's a be, beginning under the Clinton administration, under President Bush, under President Obama, they're very, very cautious about deploying large numbers of forces abroad. I mean, now we don't have the forces. I mean, we're at the limits of what can be deployed mm -hmm. in, terms of, uh, in terms of ground strength because of the exhaustion of Iraq and Afghanistan. But you're right, it, that, is, that was foremost on their mind why they came up with the option for strikes in the first place. Not to mention, as you've hinted at, the domestic sensitivities of other countries where U.S. boots are on the ground, which is a no-go for Pakistan and Yemen. But uh, these strikes from planes from a distance is, makes them less uneasy. So for those reasons, yeah, we don't want American casualties. And the, these countries don't want uh, U.S. soldiers on their uh, sovereign territory. Your, your book then, and let me show the, the book again, Between Threats and Wars. Uh, is focused on discrete military operations. What is, in layman's terms, a discrete military operation, and, and how can we locate it in the, the, the spectrum of the use of power? Sure. Well, a lot of people have studied large wars. and In fact, they've been sort of overstudied, overprivileged in, the, in both social sciences and military history. And then a lot of people are studying what they call sta stability operations or peacekeeping, which is the, the not use of force, but trying to control territory uh, post-conflict or before conflict reemerges, And so somewhere in between there, though, there are these limited uses of force that I thought were increasing since the end of the Cold War. And these are operations which are not intending to take down a regime. So we're not trying to topple a government. And we're not trying to conquer and hold territory, which is peacekeeping. And we're also not trying to destroy an opponent's military force. Right, so these are sort of limited one-off or small series of strikes which are intended to, which are kinetic, which are actual strikes, and which try to achieve a, a, a political objective on the ground. And it's not, so I'm not interested in Iraq and Afghanistan because any discrete military operations that happens there are part of a wider campaign. And I'm not interested in, in say, Bosnia or Kosovo where the U.S. is there in small numbers to really keep a peace. But it's these limited strikes in Pakistan, Somalia, Yemen, Syria, where it's U.S. forces on the trigger dropping bombs uh, to achieve or to attempt to achieve some political objective on the ground. Now, now traditionally, let's do a little IR here. Uh, what what uh, military force uh, is often has uh, has is used for? You identify three political purposes. Mm -hmm. Talk about them. What 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 might be in the mind of the policymakers in terms of what they want to accomplish? This is something that I always try when I talk to civilian policymakers to make them really think about what is their political intent. Because every use of force has some political intent, whether you whether you have identified it or not. And so the three that I use based upon the classic Thomas Schelling definition of this is punishment, deterrence, and compellence. Right. Punishment is just is usually acts in response to somebody, or punishment or coercion is another term for it, which is a uh, has doesn't really have much of a secondary goal, but it's intended to retaliate for something that you did to me to make it hurt. Uh, period. Mm -hmm. Deterrence is to try to stop you from doing something, and compellence is to try to compel you to do something. And so these are the sorts of three things that I think you can sort of categorize all uses of military force. Um, and I do so in the, in, the, in the appendix to the book of the, the cases I look at in the post-Cold War world. Mm -hmm. and, and so for an example of, of punishment would be President Clinton's uh, 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 directed military operation against uh, Saddam Hussein's uh, intelligence services in retaliation for uh, an apparent attempt 
to assassinate former President Bush. Right. So that's the first the, president. Right. Bush. The primary objective is punishment, and the second is deterrence, which mm -hmm. is to deter uh, Saddam Hussein from supporting further international terrorism. And that's a case where both political objectives met. Right. Punishment only works if you destroy the actual. Uh, objective. So if you destroy the, in that case, it was the intelligence headquarters building, or if you, if it's a targeted killing, you kill the individual, uh, then punishment uh, works. If you miss, punishment doesn't work because they don't feel any pain. But in that case, both punishment worked, and we know of no instance since then where Saddam Hussein provided support for international terrorist uh, operations against U.S. or U.S. interests. Mm -hmm. One gets a sense when you, when you read uh, 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 writings about our strategic thinkers and our, our military people, that some of this may be in the, in the minds of the, op the operatives, mm -hmm. essentially, mm -hmm. as opposed to, in Vietnam, I guess we learned that they weren't uh, uh, responding in the way we expected uh, and reading the, uh, the, uh, the efforts to, for example, compel them to change their behavior. Right. I mean, you have to have a good understanding, what they call red teaming. You have to be able to place yourselves in the, your adversary's uh, position. What is their interests, intentions, capabilities? What do they prize? And well, how could you use military force or some other instrument of national power to, to, to deal with that calculation? And in a lot of instances, we have a great deal of difficulty doing that. The United States policymakers have a great deal of difficulty doing that, I think. So, so you, in, in this book, what, give us a sense again of the problem and the methodology by which you tried to answer your question. Right, it's, it's policy value to book. So I tried to understand, does, limited, does US limited military force work? And so, first of all, you have to create a phenomenon and if you want to make a name for yourself, you have an acronym. So we have DMO, which is Discrete Military <laughs> Operations. And we thought about what is this phenomenon? How is it distinct from other places in the field? And in the field, there's course of diplomacy. <coughs> excuse me. There's like gunboat diplomacy. There's uh, strategic bombing. There's larger things. So this is this sort of fits in a in a little um, in a little spectrum there. So I you know create a phenomenon, and then how do you how do you uh, find the data on it? So to limit myself, I just did post. Cold War through June 1st, 2009, although I had to cut off the counting of the Pakistan drone strikes because they just escalate so much in mid-2008. But I come up with a, 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 a data set of 36 f um, uses of limited force, which is fairly robust enough to try to do some evaluation. And then I code them for success on their military and political objectives, which is uh, on, so I have three, which is success, mixed success, or failure. The military success is fairly easy to determine, which is if there is a piece of the Iraqi integrated air defense system that you wanted to target, you either destroyed it or you didn't, or you destroyed it or you partially destroyed it or something like that. So the, if you destroyed it, it's a success. If you missed, it's a failure. If it's a mixed success, it's a mixed success. The political success is a little, is a little, uh, d little more difficult to determine. You know, either you deterred if it's a strike, the strike today, <coughs> excuse me, in Pakistan. The goal is to punish. Al Qaeda or its affiliates, but it's also to deter them from conducting uh, future terror operations. So the punishment, you know, it can work or not based upon whether you kill the target individual. What we do know is that they don't succeed in deterring Al Qaeda from training uh, future operatives, from uh, recruitment, from disseminating propaganda, et cetera. So the deterrent side has failed. That's not in their calculation. They're not. They don't find the U.S. military force that uh, persuasive to their calculus. So that's sort of what I did. And then I did three in-depth case studies, uh, the, the Iraqi no-fly zones, the 1998 US cruise missile strikes in Afghanistan and Sudan, and then the November 2002 uh, predator drone strike in Yemen. And then what I also did was looked at what are instances where limited force were, was at the highest levels of government just debated but not used. So at the Principals Committee level, the National Security Council, when did they debate using a discrete military operation but decide not to? And those are called negative cases. And I did an in-depth case study on uh, a negative case, which is in the summer of 2002, when President Bush debated whether or not to use limited force to go after the Ansar al-Islam terrorist camp in northern Iraq, where we now know Abu Musab al-Zarqawi was, and they were creating toxins and ricins for use against Western Europe. And in that case, it was a very close call but the president uh, ultimately decided not to. So my appendix has 
the universe of cases of, of DMOs and then the universe of cases of negative DMOs, where uh, negative cases where DMOs were proposed but not used. The second one is more incomplete, assuredly, because there are many times where uh, options get proposed and then they aren't leaked or I can't find out the, about them with interviews. Um, but the first, I think, is a fairly robust uh, uh, finding. So, so bottom line here is you're actually looking at the cases where uh, the, the directed military operations were tried and saying, hey, did this work or not? Yeah, it's a very common policy evaluative dissertation tool. So, you know, one, what is the policy you're evaluating? How do you define it? How do you justify your data collection? How do you justify your case studies? And how do you justify your findings? And undoubtedly, I'll be challenged on uh, all four of those things. But uh, you know, this was my dissertation. I had a lot of people yell at me throughout the, uh, throughout the process and defending it and then turning it into a book with uh, Stanford. So uh, you get a pretty good scrub in the peer review process. But uh, undoubtedly, there'll be people who challenge it. Bottom line is, you're saying that from a political standpoint, it doesn't work. Is that, is that uh, a simplification? It's a simplification, I would say, be, uh, lower your expectations for how you think it will work. You know, there's a lot of, especially among civilian officials who think limited military force is the answer. But the one, the one other thing which I don't deal with much in the book, which I hint at and has become more apparent to me as I further this research is that, you know, there's always this notion of we're going to use limited force. There are all these elements of, na of uh, national power. There's a persistent foreign policy problem. We're going to use military force, but we're not just going to do that. We're going to do diplomacy, economic uh, disruption, cutting terrorist financing. We have all these other tools we can go after them with. But limited military force gets everyone's attention, and then it sucks all the oxygen out of the interagency debate. So you use force, you think you're going to do everything else, and in fact, you don't. And, and then you're left months later with this, facing the same problem because it doesn't achieve the impact you want on the ground. You know, you might get lucky and hit the targeted person you want to kill, but it's very likely they'll, that problem of why people uh, want to attack the United States or its deployed forces isn't going to go away, and that requires a longer term, comprehensive, prioritized strategy which deal with all the other elements of national power. So I tell people, significantly lower your expectations for what it can achieve. Now, uh, there, there are, are two elements here as, as I listen to you and have read the book. One is, I guess you would call it a humanitarian issue. And the humanitarian issue seems to be that uh, uh, what this is a, let me characterize what the U.S. is doing. It's kicking the can down the road on the one hand, and it's also putting uh, the use of military power on almost like cruise control. Mm -hmm. And so the, the question becomes, what are the, the, the humanitarian costs in terms of killing the wrong people, killing innocent people, uh, setting this up so you keep doing without reflecting on the consequences when you do the act, and then the consequences of neglecting the other instruments of power. Right. Well, to quote General David Petraeus and many others, you know, you can't capture or kill your way out of the problem. You can't capture your killer at industrial strength insurgency. In the tribal belts of Pakistan alone, there are something like six, which is where most of Pakistanis don't live, they're very unpopulated areas, but there's something like six million uh, male age, uh, military aged males. So you can't kill all six million. Uh, we're trying, we've done over 200 drone strikes and the United States has undoubtedly, <coughs> excuse me, killed quite a few people, but you can't kill your way out of the problem. Once you accept that proposition, you have to ask your question is, do these strikes make it more or less likely that more people are supporting the insurgent effort or more or less likely that they aren't. You know, most people aren't insurgents. They don't support you. I mean, they, there's public opinion polling now out of northwest Pakistan. Most people, they don't like drone strikes and they don't like the Taliban in pretty equal numbers. So they're neutral third parties. How do you affect their calculus? In a counterinsurgency, the, the way people always describe it is you clear, you hold, and then you build. So clear is using military force to get rid of bad guys holding it so people can come back in in numbers, and then you build a community where they can live, you build security forces uh, to protect them, uh, and then you transition to another government. Discrete military options by definitions are what I call clear and disappear. 
which is you do a limited strike at 2.45 a.m. in the morning, and then you're gone. And what that did to the people on the ground, we don't really know. It has nothing to do with, the, with, the, with their lives. It doesn't improve their lives, necessarily make it better. But it probably, their lives may be over, yeah. Their lives may be over, but you have almost assuredly created more people ag aggrieved by the presence, by the mm -hmm. US doing this. So unless you're willing to uh, change the, the factor on the ground, which is building uh, Pakistani security forces, in the case of Pakistan, doing political uh, reconciliation and accommodation for people who have fairly just grievances, helping their livelihoods, dealing with uh, massive unemployment, uh, you're not going to change the factor that led to their rise in the first place. And you can keep, as other, another metaphor people use, it's like uh, destroying the beehive by hitting bees one at a time. You can do it forever, uh, but it doesn't necessarily make you any safer. And, the, and in the case of Pakistan, we know this hasn't because uh, since 9-11, almost every major international terrorist plot emanates from the tribal areas of Pakistan. This is after 200 drone strikes over the course of six and a half years. Every major international terrorist plot comes from roughly the same area. So, so uh, again, let's go back to the, the threats that we're facing and, and build on what you just said. These, are, these threats are political problems. And we are trying to use a military uh, uh, instrument to address those problems. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is they may be increasing the political <laughs> problems that grow with the strategic threat. Right. I, I don't say military uh, response isn't one of the tools that should be included. But for example, in Pakistan, Afghanistan, there was no comprehensive strategy for the AFPAC region until December 2009. There is one now. You can find it. It's on the State Department website, signed by uh, Secretary Gates and Secretary Clinton, which tries to uh, prioritize all the sort of US elements of national power under one comprehensive strategy. There was no comprehensive strategy for Yemen until April 2009. There was a military strategy. There was a USAID development strategy, where there was a State Department diplomacy strategy, all working at sort of cross purposes oftentimes. Um, and so on, I, I say, you know, military, the military tool might be necessary, but on its own, it will never solve the problem. And so you need some way that, they, that uh, all the elements of national power are working together in, uh, in, one, in one way. And in the case of the, especially these covert operations, they aren't, because USAID, State Department, they don't really know about them. These are, these are such classified operations that they're really limited to a small number of national security decision makers and the CIA. The, the history of American uh, use of technology uh, in, in shaping our foreign and defense policy is to try to do things on the cheap, to save money. I, that, I remember that with the, the whole problem of the defense of Europe during the Cold War and, and uh, flexible response and so on. So, so th there's a contradiction here mm -hmm. in, the, in the sense that, hey, let's use the drones mm -hmm. to let's make a point. Uh, and it's, it's uh, cheaper, at least in terms of the loss of life. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's, as we just said, not dealing with the political problem. And it's also cheaper in terms of money. I mean, after 02, the US did this one, November 02, this one drone strike strike in Yemen to get somebody who was connected to the 98 East, Asia, East Africa embassy bombings. It succeeded. It killed the identified individual. And US support for Yemen decreases. US attention to Yemen decreases. There's, there's, it's getting 30 to $50 million uh, a year, according to the foreign affairs budget, probably some covert money as well. And now they're talking about you know, having $250 million in military aid, throwing all sorts of more money at the problem. But between 02 and roughly 09, US attention and support for Yemen dropped off, to, dropped off significantly. And so we tried to do it cheaply, and the threat emerged. And now we're trying to raise our attention on it, and we're flying drones, armed drones, over uh, Yemen to this day. And we're going to try a military solution again, and we're throwing more money at it. But unless you deal with the uh, grievances of the tribes, if you deal with the lack of development, if you deal with an over-militarized society, you have rebels in the north, the secessionist movement in the south, mm -hmm. all these other political issues, uh, US limited strikes from a distance aren't going to solve uh, the underlying problems of why groups related to al-Qaeda continue to operate from Yemen. Mm -hmm. And as we've just said, it, it may increase the problem. It may increase the problem. And, and in addition, we may be tooled around by whoever the third party uh, uh, 
a partner we have, say, in Yemen. Assuredly. I mean, we in Yemen, we're, we, they want a threat which the U.S. will provide money towards. Mm -hmm. uh, without it, they just wouldn't get that much money from Yemen and other countries. In Pakistan, the U.S. The US has given roughly $20 billion to Pakistan now since 9-11. A lot of that money is reimbursements for military operations they take, but it's also for lots for buying lots of other things, which they can use, by the way, also to build up their defense forces in case uh, India, in case there's a confrontation with India, which they believe is the primary security threat to the nation. Um, so yeah, it's in their interest to have U.S. support at very high levels. One of the uh, uh, disturbing elements of this is the way uh, uh, it impacts democratic choice in the United States about the way ahead. Uh, interestingly enough, it's Clinton and Obama who, uh, since they're not going to do war, or at least they, they'll finish a war that somebody else starts, but they, they're not uh, motivated to, to go in uh, with the full penalty of, of uh, military power. It's, a, it's an option that uh, has no political cost for them. In fact, there are incentives to pursue this even if they had your book mm -hmm. on their desk, read it, took notes. Mm -hmm. they, there, there are political reasons why they might want to not only do this, but escalate it. Well, Democrats in particular have a great fascination with special operations forces and drones and cruise missiles and technological solutions because they don't want large army, they don't want a huge end strength, and they don't want to be engaged in ground wars in places like in Iraq and Afghanistan, understandably. And so, you know, you look after 95 and the Dayton Peace Accords, President Clinton deployed 20,000 U.S. peacekeepers to Bosnia. He told Congress they'll be gone in one year. And no one believed it at the time. And of course, they, they came back soon after. But that impression of, uh, of getting stuck on having to deploy tens of thousands of US forces to the Balkans really had a big imprint on President Clinton when he thought later about using force to go after bin Laden and al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. They were not going to deploy a large number of US forces. That, that option was not on the table. The relationship was also poisoned between him and Republicans in the Senate. Uh, but they just weren't going to think about it. Obama, too, he does not want to put large numbers of troops abroad. And the fallback solution in lieu of uh, boots on the ground is uh, bombs from the air. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, a, a, a chunk of your book is, is really about, uh, and, and in, in, in a general way, it may be surprising to many people in the public, the, the military really inclines not to do these operations. It is the surgical strike civilians mm -hmm. uh, who basically let's go for it because it solves a lot of political problems in the, in the way we, we just talked about. Not the political problems in the region, but the political domestic problems. Uh, you're able to demonstrate that uh, you're tough, uh, you can deal with your neoconservative opposition and so on. Talk a little about that. Why, yeah. why does the military not want to do this? Well, it's lessons of Vietnam, and it's impressed in the professional military education system under uh, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Colin Powell, who had what was called the Powell Doctrine in 1992, where he said the U.S. shouldn't deploy forces abroad in larger numbers unless it has a clear and achievable end state unless it has the support of Congress and the public, unless there's going to be little political interference. So they want to be able to send several divisions to the Balkans and do what they want with no uh, civilian oversight and interference. Of course, it's not the way conflict works today. But when I interviewed lots of senior military officials, when I, you know, you read the literature, it is, has a very strong, distinct impression. They think if you're going to use limited force, it's a slippery slope to a bigger problem so just like in, in Vietnam, we had small numbers of military advisors deployed in the very early 60s. And then we sent in more to secure them. And then we sent in more to try to destroy the NVA. Similar to if you're going to do a small number of drone strikes in, say, Somalia, or maybe open up a, uh, a port in Kismayo, the next thing you might need to do is support, uh, is, to, is to guard, uh, say you want to put a US embassy there, or you want to guard peacekeepers there. And then pretty soon, you have large numbers of force there. And they know that the military has a lot of resources, and they're really good at planning. And when things go wrong, the military is the default uh, people to go ahead and do this. So what happens is there is a persistent foreign policy problem. And civilians looking for some solution turn to the military and say, well, what, you know, what can you do? 
And what the military does in the planning process is they say, well, tell me what your desired end state is. What, what's the ultimate objective you want to achieve? And then I'll think about solutions which may or may not uh, include the use of military force. I'll, I'll provide a bunch of options, a bunch of operations. I'll give you a likelihood of success or failure for how to go about it. But the notion that on your own, uh, this, this limited use of force is going to resolve the problem is unlikely to be true, and the military knows this. And they know that when things go wrong, they will be the, called on to resolve the problem. And they also know when things go wrong, it damages the reputation of the US military. The average length of service for a civilian in the Pentagon at senior levels is two years. By the time you're a decision maker in the military at the sort of brigadier general to lieutenant general level, you've been in the service for 30 to 35 years. So they have a very longer institutional memory, whereas civilians get their information from movies, from YouTube videos, from wherever, and they have very radically different ideas about what military force can achieve. And you say at one point, and, and it is crucial here, that uh, uh, DMOs, uh, directed military operations, have no built-in sense of victory. Right. There, there's no, there's no end to this. So, so what? That's why we get uh, uh, critics like Andrew Basevich saying we're heading toward permanent war, mm -hmm. and even Petraeus is now saying we're talking about permanent war. So this is an instrument that keeps the can keeps kicking the can down the road, but but you're suggesting that it, it may not accomplish the political objectives. Well, we know a lot about how terrorism and insurgencies end. So there are a couple major studies out there that look at that. One significant one by Rand looks at all the insurgencies that ended be, uh, the 68 and 2004, and military force is the determining objective less than 7% of the time. It's political accommodation, it's political reconciliation, and it's also penetration by local and, dis and dismantlement by local intelligence and police agencies. Now, we have none of that in Yemen or Pakistan or Somalia, areas where we believe uh, international terrorist groups are operating from, but we can keep doing this thing that works 7% of the time forever, but the likelihood that that will ever resolve and will create these groups uh, termination is highly, highly unlikely. So yeah, you kick the can down the road forever at very low cost to yourself and financial costs and cost to deployed forces, but it doesn't resolve the underlying political problems. And it could be a high cost to the people who are the uh, recipients in the bombs in the way the people were who you interacted with as a young person. Assuredly, I mean, the, uh, there was one strike in May in 09, it's the last strike the U.S. has done in Yemen. There were, uh, I'm sorry, there was one in December and one in May. The May, they, the provisional deputy governor was killed by accident as well as his bodyguard who was allegedly meeting with some al-Qaeda officials. In December 09, there was a cruise missile strike where something like 43 people were killed, 41 of whom were civilians, according to Amnesty International and the Yemeni government who went in afterwards to look at it. So there are civilian casualties at times when these happen, despite the very best efforts of the U.S military and the CIA to prevent them from happening. So it's a high cost to them, but it's a low cost to the United States, in particular decision makers, who have to demonstrate that they're doing something about this problem. And when you need to demonstrate you're doing something, the alluring, responsive option is repeatedly military force. So, so the, the, the scenario runs something like this. There, there is a, uh, an attempt uh, on an airplane to do something that uh, a terrorist attempt is linked to a camp in Pakistan uh, requiring, this is all hypothetical, uh, uh, requiring uh, some sort of American response. At this point, uh, we might use directed military operations. But the bottom line is, until we deal with the, the geopolitical problem in that area, Pakistan's relation to India, uh, Pakistan's uh, relation to its own uh, ungovernable uh, territories, its policy in Afghanistan to get strategic. I mean, you can go on and on, but these are big political problems which our leaders don't have the time or interest in dealing with. And we know that these, unfortunately, these threats will continue. So it, it, it's a kind of unending process. I, I'm, I'm sort of sitting here listening to this, and uh, your, your analysis leads to some you know, awful conclusions, because what our policymakers are doing clearly doesn't work. I would say 
it clearly doesn't work on its own. It will not be the, uh, on its own, military force is never the only solution. And this is not a, not a big issue. This is what David Petraeus says. This is what Secretary Gates says. But I would add that uh, the insurgents, the terrorists who operate from these regions also have a vote in what happens. So they take defensive countermeasures to survive, which is they've killed, uh, especially in Pakistan, a lot of suspected informants. They've destroyed communication towers. They've dispersed now to, to other areas of the tribal, uh, tribal regions where they never had been before. They go back to Afghanistan. They've gone to Karachi and larger cities. And they've uh, shifted resources and attention to Somalia and Yemen. So they have a role in responding to what we do. There, there's all sorts of really interesting sort of neat tactics that they've undertaken to protect their lives. And every time you know, human beings are adaptable, mobile survival, they'll find ways to survive and ways to put, place themselves where US forces from a distance cannot get at them. And you're seeing that already. Uh, so they have a vote for how they'll survive to regroup, to conduct uh, and plot, and to, re and to disseminate propaganda, and to recruit over and over and over again. And some people you just can't uh, create political accommodation or reconciliation with, and they need to be detained or killed. But there are large numbers of neutral third parties and people who leave terrorist groups, and they've done so for centuries and centuries and centuries, and using force to coerce them out of, the, out of terrorist groups rarely works. What one lesson or two that would you like uh, policymakers to draw from your book? The one, one lesson is be skeptical of military force <clears throat> as the option for all things, not just on the political side, but on the military side. I mean, one of the things that I find out is it turns out we know intelligence fails or changes very quickly, so militarily you fail. Weapon systems fail. The uh, launching platforms fail. Uh, and then anything involving human beings fail. You know, the wrong intelligence is put into the weapon system. Somebody makes a misidentification at the last moment. And so militarily, even US with its amazing $700 billion budget, 550 of which is just for buying stuff, 150 is for the ongoing operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, a intelligence budget of some $60, $70 billion, the US cannot destroy and kill anyone they want to. I mean, there's a reason the US has been trying to get bin Laden for almost 10 years now and has allegedly no idea where he is. So be skeptical on the political side and on the military side of what can happen. But then the other side, the other issue is think seriously, if you believe this is true, about all the elements of national power. Why does the uh, State Department budget, which was proposed to be $59 billion, they're going to try to cut five out of it or something like that. Why does the State Department get less than one-tenth of what the military gets? Why, as Secretary Gates always says, are there more people in military marching bands than State Department foreign affairs officers? Why are there something like 1,600 to 2,000 USAID development officers? Why, if these are the, 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 the tools, mm -hmm. Department of Agriculture, Justice, USAID state that are required to deal with these problems, why are they under, chronically underfunded year after year after year after year when you're trying to buy a fifth generation fighter, a next generation of long range bomber? You know, why does the United States need around 3,500 to 5,000 nuclear weapons? How are these things uh, going to help us protect the US homeland from persistent ongoing threats? And the answers are found elsewhere. On that uh, note, uh, uh, I want to thank you uh, very much. Let me show your book again, Be Between Threats and War. And uh, thank you for this uh, very uh, informative discussion. Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate being here. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.